Let's take a brief look at how the scientists were thinking way back in the 1600s. See, Newton was of the view that light consists of a stream of particles. So, Newton had proposed the corpuscular theory of light. Newton proposed the corpuscular theory of light according to which he believed that light was a stream of particles. Now, yet his contemporary, a Dutch physicist and astronomer named Christian Huygens said that light did not consist of a stream of particles, but he advanced the wave theory. And his idea was that light travels by means of waves. Now, Newton, however, challenged the wave theorists by saying that if light were actually a wave, then it should be able to bend around corners or diffract. which is to say that light should diffract. So Newton challenged the wave theorists by saying that since light doesn't bend around corners or it doesn't get diffracted, so light is not a wave but is a stream of particles. Now in 1660, an Italian physicist called Francisco Grimaldi identified diffraction. He showed that a beam bent slightly outward after passing through a narrow aperture and gave this phenomena the name by which it is known today, which is diffraction. And this is our topic for discussion today. Now diffraction is not something that is limited to light waves only. In your daily life, you actually more easily observe the diffraction of sound waves or the diffraction of water waves. Let's just look at an example for each of these. See, at times when you're looking at a clear blue sky, you might have seen those tiny floaters or hair-like structures. You know, hair-like structures like this. So, that is due to the diffraction of light. In this case, light is getting diffracted around tiny deposits uh, which are there inside the I. Now, an example of diffraction of water waves could be, say you have plane waves coming in from this direction and then you have some kind of an obstacle and there is a narrow opening. Now, the water waves are going to move in a pattern like this. So, the water waves get diffracted. These are water waves which are getting diffracted because they are moving into a region where you would normally not expect them to reach. And an example of sound waves could be, say we have a tree here and your friend stands here and you are standing on the other side. Now if your friend shouts out to you, you can hear him because sound seems to have gone around the tree and it has reached you. So you do observe the diffraction of sound waves. Now the diffraction of light waves is something that you don't see that easily but you see the diffraction of water waves and sound waves more easily because there is some particular condition which is being satisfied and that condition is the size of the obstacle the size of the obstacle, it could be an obstacle or it could be an opening through which the waves are traveling has to be comparable with the wavelength of the waves which are getting diffracted. Okay, so now let's define diffraction. Diffraction is the name given to the spreading of waves after they pass through openings that are comparable to the 
to their wavelength see actually light also gets diffracted when it passes around an edge when it passes around an edge or an obstacle which is placed in its path we'll just look at an experiment where it is passing around light passes around an obstacle there's a pin head which is placed in the path of light so diffraction can take place either when light is passing through an opening of size comparable to its wavelength or it passes around an edge or an obstacle placed in its path and if you would think of the wavelength the wavelength of visible light is around 400 to 700 nanometers so which means that the size of the aperture should be of this range which is an extremely small opening this will be about 400 into 10 to the power minus 9 meters to 700 into 10 to the power minus 9 meters now let's take a look at this experiment that demonstrates diffraction we have a pin that is placed in front of a source of monochromatic light that is green in color and the shadow is observed on the screen over here what you see on the screen is a diffraction pattern so you see a shadow region over here and you see concentric diffraction rings around this now if you notice the center of the shadow you find something very interesting you find a bright spot at the center of the shadow now do you ordinarily see something like this in a shadow this demonstrate that light has traveled and it has bent into the shadow region and reached a point where would you would normally expect to find a completely dark shadow let us look at the diffraction pattern formed at a single slit both the source and the observer in this case are far away from the obstructing surface so the outgoing rays are parallel so which means that we'll be considering these rays which are traveling from here to be parallel to each other now the pattern which is formed on the screen is a diffraction pattern we've shown it separately over here we've uh, drawn the diffraction pattern over here and since uh, we've presumed a monochromatic a green monochromatic source of light we've shown the bands as green in color now if you look at the bands the central bright band is much broader than the width of the slit and this is bordered by alternating dark and bright bands with rapidly decreasing intensity so you can see the brightness of the fringes decreases quite fast now this this band over here this is the central bright band this is the central bright band and if you notice its width is double that of the other band other bands now let us see why are these bands formed see each point on the wave front these were rays so we have wave fronts over here which are perpendicular to the rays each point on the wave front acts as a source of secondary wavelets this was actually basically huygens principle that each point on the wave front acts as a source of secondary wavelets now the overlapping of these wavelets or the combined effect of these wavelets at a distant point over here on the screen either results in a bright fringe or a dark fringe now let's see how does this happen
the central fringe over here will be a bright fringe that is because huygens wavelets which start from here are all traveling the same distance to reach points over here so if they are traveling the same distance then the path difference between them is zero and the phase difference between these waves is also zero in that case they will interfere constructively so if they interfere or they overlap constructively which is in phase with each other then a bright fringe or brightness will be seen at that position now let us take the end of the bright fringes we have this point p over here which is the first dark fringe the first dark fringe would mean the end of the bright fringes so this over here is the end of the bright fringe on both the sides so you'll have a point p over here and similarly at the same distance you have a point p over here which would be the first dark fringe now let us understand why is a dark fringe observed at this point now first of all we will divide this slit into two halves so the width of the slit is a and this portion is a by 2 so this is a by 2 and the other half of the slit is also a by 2 next we will draw two rays so we will draw two rays one from the top of the first half so this is one ray and the other from the top of the second half this is the first half and this is the second half so one ray from here now say we just label them let's call this ray 1 and this is ray 2 now the waves from the waves corresponding to these rays the huygen wavelets corresponding to these rays are undergoing totally destructive interference when they reach this point p over here when they originate from here the wavelets are in phase over here because they are originating from the same wave front but when they reach the point p over here they are in interfering destructively which means the path difference between them if i drop a perpendicular over here this is the path difference between them the path difference between them has introduced a phase difference between these waves i have described these conditions a little in detail in the episode on interference so if you like you can take a look at that theta is this angle over here that the point makes with the central axis now we mentioned earlier that this distance d capital d over here is much greater than a the width of the slit since d is much greater than a these rays r1 and r2 can be considered to be parallel so we can take r1 and r2 in this way and if you notice they are from the same wave front so the starting wave front is the same now there is a path difference between r1 and r2 this is r1 and this is r2 and that path difference can be shown over here and this is the path difference between these two rays this is a by 2 and this angle is 90 degrees so this would also be theta because this 
Let's draw a straight line over here. So, since this angle is theta, this angle is theta, so this is also theta. Now, the path difference between these rays, R1 and R2, is A by 2 sine theta, which you can see from this little triangle over here. Say, I call this triangle A, B, C. Then you can see from triangle A, B, C that B, C is the path difference and B, C is A by 2 sine theta. And since we have destructive interference, this is equal to lambda over 2. Now this gives sine theta equals lambda over A, which gives us the position of the first dark fringe. Next, to find the next dark fringe, say at a point further on the screen over here, there would be the next dark fringe, say this is P and this is P dash. Now to find the next dark fringe over here, say this is at an angular position theta 2. We could divide the slit now into four equal parts. And similarly, we consider rays from the four different parts and wavelets for each of these parts. Now they are all interfering destructively and causing a dark fringe. So for the next dark fringe we would have A by 4 sine theta equals lambda by 2 which gives us sine theta equals twice lambda over A. Similarly, the positions of all the dark fringes can be found and we would get A sine theta equals n lambda where n can take values 1, 2, 3 and so on and each of this gives us a dark fringe. Now if these are all dark fringes then in between the dark fringes you would have the position of the bright fringes. So the position of the bright fringes is going to be in between the dark fringes. And the bright fringes would be at sine theta equals n plus half lambda over a. This is the position of the dark fringes and this is the position of the bright fringes.